The explosion of plastic waste across the world threatens the very survival of life on our planet. Every year, up to 12 million metric tons of plastic enters our oceans. From poisoning marine life, to littering landscapes and clogging waterways, plastic waste in the environment is set to triple in the next decade. The problem is so vast it can seem overwhelming. But by reimagining this waste as a resource, we can begin to redress the balance. I'm Doni Kanile in Cameroon, where a young entrepreneur is turning the tide on plastic waste by building boats out of bottles. And I'm Megan McCubbin in the UK, where one company is tackling a really sticky plastic problem, whilst making unique and sustainable products in the process. Here in Cameroon's economic capital, Douala, the scale of the country's plastic problem is painfully clear. Plastic waste is clogging up the streets and rivers of Cameroon's major cities, polluting waterways, threatening marine ecosystems, and making life especially difficult for local fishermen. It's estimated that across the city of Douala, 1,300 tons of plastic waste is generated every day. So much of it is thrown into the city's rivers, you can't see any trace of water. Wow. I've never seen anything quite like this before. I don't even know how you begin to fix a problem this big. There's no doubt this is a major challenge for the city. But one local man has made it his mission to deal with it head on. His name is Ishmael Isume. Ishmael! Hi. Nice. So good to meet you. Nice to meet you, Ndedi. I mean, it's quite a place to meet, I must say. So is this normal here in Douala? Uh, you know, it's so sad. It's really sad. You have all the plastics that are thrown away by people in the street, in the household. And then you have the river, the water that collect all the waste that clog this bridge. And then you have people stopping with their car and throw their trash in the river. And you can see that plastic bag. People are not educated on how to manage their waste. So, unfortunately, it's normal. It's overwhelming to see this, but you don't find it overwhelming. Why do you see this and think that this is something you want to take on for yourself? I realize that all the rivers are full of plastic. No one cares. No one says, what is this? Mm. And I was shocked to see that. So I decided to do something. And what I think that I could help to bring is changing people's mindset by showing the way. Ishmael began an initiative to clear up the waste from all of Douala's ten choked rivers. He calls his company Madiba and Nature, meaning water and nature in the local Sawa language. He recruits a team of 30 volunteers, and today I'm giving them a helping hand. But it quickly becomes clear to me what a tough job this is. So we're standing on this board because as much as this looks like a bed of plastic, there's actually a river underneath it, so it's not very stable. It's very hot and very humid here. So when you have this amount of waste in water, of course it calls mosquitoes and other kinds of waterborne diseases. And there are people who live all around here. So this is not just an environmental crisis, it's a possible health crisis as well, and a serious one. The work you're doing here is amazing, but there are so many bottles and it feels like this is just a dent. And it's really only individuals like you who are taking it on. There is no city-wide plan or nationwide plan to tackle this enormous problem. No, there is no recycling system here in Cameroon. Our politicians have other problems for the priority, so people are poor, no one's care about the environment. Yeah. This is the most urgent problem, so we need to change policy and to manage waste. Ishmael doesn't just see all this plastic as waste. He sees it as a valuable material and an opportunity to do good. He turns bottles into boats for the region's fishing community. And it all happens here inside his workshop. Ah, bottles. Yeah, this is, uh, this is our workshop place. In my house here. 
So I'm here with some member of the team and we try to finish a boat. Ishmael's boats are built using traditional techniques. Who taught you how to do this? Uh, you know, I'm from a fishing community and my dad is a fisherman. Oh wow. So when I was young, I was fishing with my dad. This technology had just adapted to the plastic bottles. So is that why this idea came to you? Yes, because the pollution affects the river. And now you cannot catch fish because the fishing area is full of plastics. So I thought to help not only to cleaning the rivers, but also to provide boat because it's not easy in the villages for someone to buy a simple boat. So now we build cheaper eco boat that could be useful. So we have part of our seat done. What's next? You want to press this? Yeah, I'd love to try. <laughs> Let's do that. So we tie this yeah, like a knot here. Okay. It's not so bad actually. You're learning fast. It is a little scary to think that what we're putting together, someone's actually going to be sitting on yep. out in the water. So I feel a little bit of responsibility to not mess this up. I'm quite proud of my handiwork, actually. Yo, you, you did this it. This isn't so bad, yeah, eh? You did it. Once he's built the frame, Ishmael ties it to the base. And then he adds in the seats. Ishmael has built 37 boats to date. Given that it takes 650 bottles to build one, that's over 24,000 bottles removed from Douala's rivers and put to good use. So how much does it cost to make a boat like this with materials oh, and everything? Oh, nothing. It's simple. You just need bottles. The rest is your time. The boats take just a few hours to build. And they're so lightweight, they're easily transported to the ocean. It's a three-hour drive to nearby Kribi, where Ishmael gifts the boats to local fishermen. Traditionally made fishing boats can be extremely expensive. But even so, when Ishmael first started giving away his eco-boats, it was easier said than done. These look very different to all of the local fishing boats that we see. What was the reaction from the local community when you brought these here for the first time? <laughs> first, they thought it was a joke. I'm sure. It will never go in the water. And after when we went to the water, people used it and said, oh, it's working. And then they start to look, to try to understand and try to see, can you go fishing with this one? The real proof, of course, is in the floating. Let's go test it out. Let's go test it. Okay. You lead the way. Yep. It was a bumpy entry, but this feels so much better. It feels stable. I don't feel unsafe in any way. I feel really comfortable fishing in one of these. <laughs> what a great idea, and there's so many possibilities of what he can do in the future that can at the same time tackle the enormous issue of plastic waste in Cameroon. I mean, what an incredible young man, but that was really fun. Now we know the boat is seaworthy, we're delivering it to the latest happy customer who's going to test it out on a nearby lake. Hi, Mr. Camille. This is Camille, the fisherman. Camille. Good to meet you. Yes. What do you think of your new boat? How do you think having this new boat is going to change things for you? For me, for me, it's going to be better. It's ideal for me, I can say it's ideal. I can't say it's better, why? Because it's less expensive. So maybe the accessibility and affordability of eco boats will be something that convinces people to give them a try. Yeah, effectivement, plusieurs pêcheurs tellement ça va beaucoup soulager beaucoup de pêcheurs qui n'ont pas de moyens de. D'abord, beaucoup vont pouvoir sauver, sauver, sauver nous, non différents. Sauver nous au besoin de leur famille. Do you want to try it out? Non, avec plaisir. Let's see. Let's see how it works. Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> How do you feel about Camille's reaction to his very own eco vote? I'm happy to see that I can make someone smile, someone get hope that maybe his condition will be better, maybe he could have more income to his family. Since he started in 2016, the growing success of his eco-boats has inspired Ishmael to do more. It's his ambition to clear up Cameroon. And that begins with the country's first bottle recycling scheme. Wow! This is the eco bean. An eco bean is made out of 255 plastic bottles and it will collect 1,000 plastic bottles. So this is a place where people can come and bring their plastic waste? This is the starting point of a strategy to really install a sorting system of plastic waste in Douala. So the idea of this eco bin, what you're trying to do here, where do you think it can grow to? We want our city to be like uh, the example in Africa. We aim to supply eco bin in the areas of Douala, the, all the corners in front of all the shops the supermarket, the school. So it will be easy to come and pick up the waste and recycle them. So that is the vision where we want to go there. But how to reach there is not easy. Despite the challenges, Ishmael has even bigger plans for the future by producing bottle-made furniture and by educating the next generation. Do something with the bottles. Fight against the pollution. Parce que quand j'étais étudiant comme vous, quand j'étais élève comme vous, surtout quand j'étais étudiant, it's a legacy to take care of environment, to take care of our planet, and to clean our cities. It's an inspiration to me that even in this global sea of plastic, one person really can make a difference. For environmental campaigners, the global issue of plastic waste is now so serious it has risen to the top of the agenda. They believe we must rethink our whole approach to the material. The scale of the plastic problem is huge. I mean, it's over 300 million tonnes a year. Plastic packaging itself is 78 million tonnes a year. 32% of that leaks out into the environment. Some of the biggest producers of plastic packaging in the world produce three million tonnes a year. So if that one producer changes the way they make plastic, that is a massive change globally. But even the biggest producer of plastic packaging in the world can't fix this on their own. This is about everyone, competitors alike, organising around a system that can be regenerative and restorative. If you look at our current economy, it's predominantly linear. We take a material out of the ground, we make something out of it, and then the majority of that material gets thrown away. We have a growing world population. We have more and more pressure on resources. The system we have today cannot run in the long term. We need to shift that economy to be one that uses materials rather than using them up. Within a circular economy, right from the beginning, you build the economy so you design out waste and pollution, you keep products cycling within that economy for as long as possible, and then you look at regenerating natural systems through the biological materials that feed into that economy. So effectively, the straight line turns into a circle. To build that circular economy for plastics, you need to go right to the beginning of the system. We need to redesign the way we think about plastics, the way we design plastics, and the way we use plastics. So we need to eliminate the plastic that we don't need. We need to innovate for different forms of plastic, which are 100% recyclable. And we need to look at how we circulate plastics. Designing a system whereby that material is collected, has value, and feeds back into the system. The thing that motivates me the most about the future is there is a massive opportunity to redesign our global economy. If we redesign that economy so it's circular, not only will we build an economy that can run in the long term, but it will unlock trillions of US dollars of economic opportunity, and it will effectively decouple economic growth from resource constraints. Plastic pollution is the hot topic in the world of environmental issues. The damage that it causes is long-lasting and wide-ranging. But whilst there is a growing consciousness of the problems that plastic cause, and you might even be doing things yourself to solve it, there is one problem that is simply hiding in plain sight. 
Every year, we chew our way through 374 trillion pieces of gum. But what you might not know is that chewing gum is essentially like chewing this piece of plastic. Bottles, chewing gums and bubble gums are all derived from oil. In fact, gum is a very similar material to latex bicycle inner tubes. And every year, we chuck away 100,000 tonnes of it globally, much of it straight onto the floor. Gum is second only to cigarettes as the world's most littered item. Across the globe, we spend $25 billion on gum every year. And demand is predicted to rise to $48 billion in 2025. It is estimated that 92% of pavements in London have chewing gum stuck on them, with 300,000 pieces estimated to be on Oxford Street alone. It's up to a small army of workers to clear it up. I'm 70 miles southwest of London in Winchester to find out what damage gum can do. Hello. Hello there. How are you? you? Councillor Jan Warwick is in charge of keeping the city streets clean. How much of a problem is gum in Winchester? They estimate that every year councils in Britain are spending more than £60 million a year just clearing up gum. That's insane. It's taken me back a little bit, actually. That's a huge figure. And, and what good use that could be put to, rather than just being spent collecting up waste off the floor. Of course, there's really only one way to get a true flavour of the gum problem on our streets. Thank you very much. Council Operations Manager Darren Lewis has offered to show me the ropes. I'd stand oh, a bit further back yeah. and get a better angle on it. Right, I see. Push it that More way. like that way. Yeah, a little bit like that. More Definitely like a different. hoover. Yeah, yeah, it's very much like a hoover. Is it coming out at all? I thought it'd be quite a satisfying job, to be honest, but it's actually a much tougher. Massive respect for the guys doing this all the time. It's really difficult. Once gum is removed, it usually ends up in landfill. As a plastic, gum isn't biodegradable and will never decompose. But I've heard about an ingenious new initiative that's not only keeping the sticky stuff off the pavements, but turning it into something useful. Coffee cups. I think the most impressive thing about them, they're actually made out of recycled chewing gum. Mm -hmm. Never knew you could recycle that one, but here <laughs> you have it. <laughs> it's quite impressive, isn't it? Yeah. I, and seriously, that, that doesn't... Wow, okay. So when these first came out then, what were your thoughts? I thought it was a bit of a joke, to be honest. I just couldn't believe that this could be made out of people's chewing gum. It just makes you think, oh, that's so unhygienic, it's disgusting. But then when you realise that it's been through a heating process and it's completely sanitary, it's just really inspiring what can be done with chewing gum. The cups are made from a gum-based material called gum tech. Here at Winchester University, the raw materials for the cups are collected all over campus in distinctive bright pink bins. They're called gumdrops, an inspiring idea from designer Anna Bullis. Hi, you must be Anna. Hi, nice to meet Hi, you. Hi, nice to meet you too. So these must be your bins. Tell me a bit about them. Yeah, these are the gumdrop bins. Um, they are bins specifically for the disposal of waste chewing gum. And the idea is, is that somebody can come along, pop their used chewing gum in there. Once it's full, the whole thing comes back to us and we recycle it. And we can actually recycle three new gumdrops out of one full gumdrop. Wow. So it's based on a closed loop recycling process. Okay, so why gum? All the solutions out there at the moment all address gum litter once it's already been dropped. There was nothing out there that was actually addressing it from the front end. So I saw a gap in the market for a product like this and also a way of tackling behavioural change when it comes to gum litter and giving people a sort of positive way to dispose of their chewing gum. So how does gum end up in a coffee cup? Anna has offered to show me the process in action at the Gumdrop Factory in Worcester. So once we get the full gumdrop bins back, mm. that goes through the first part of the process, 
which actually size reduces it. Okay. So you can actually see the gumdrop bin has been crushed up. Yeah. You can see all the other litters that are in there along with yeah, the look at that. chewed chewing gum. Chewing gum, what's that? Is that a cupcake wrapper? Cake, orange peel. It then goes through the second stage, which separates the gumdrop bin, the chewed gum, and the other waste. We then take this mix. Yeah. We then mix it with other recycled materials, which get heated and compounded to produce these pellets, which go on to actually make, make the bins, the new gumdrop bins. And Brilliant. the cycle starts again. The gum tech material can be moulded into a whole range of products. Not just cups, but stationery, key rings, boots, and shoes. Wow, look at all this. These are some of our products that we have at the moment. Okay. Um, I'll introduce you to the, the gum shoe first. This is actually a really fun project we had. It was done in collaboration with the council in Amsterdam. We wanted to highlight the amount of gum litter that was actually on the streets in Amsterdam. So you'll see mm. the sole here is actually a map of the streets wow. that we looked at in okay. Amsterdam. The gumdrop story continues to grow. There are now some 650 gumdrop locations across the UK, from train stations and city centres to airports and schools. And with new interest in Europe and the USA, Anna has global ambitions for the company and its ethos. Working more publicly is definitely something that we want to do because that will also broaden the, the awareness and the message around behavioural change and what we can actually do with, with the recycled chewing gum. At the University of Winchester, where the gumdrop trials began, they employed a scheme designed to do more than just keep gum off our streets. As well as installing the gumdrops, they also gave away over 10,000 reusable gum-based cups. Their scheme inspired a paradigm shift in attitude to waste and litter. Environment officer Liz Harris was behind introducing gumdrop to the campus. So how much of an effect have these cups had on the sale of plastic and general kind of coffee cup use? To date, we have saved 85,000 disposable cups from being used. There are now 10,000 of these cups in circulation and we have just committed to eliminating single-use plastics by 2022. So the cups are a really good step in the right direction and I think it has really captured people's imaginations because what was quite nice is that we could link it to the chewing gum recycling and by having your cup, you're helping to close the loop. These gumdrop bins have started a chewing gum recycling craze, but it's much more than that. It's about changing people's behavior. And people like Anna are inspiring people to think about the way they use single-use products, and which is so critical if we're gonna be able to reverse any of the current worrying environmental trends. Entrepreneurs across the globe are turning their attention to the plastic menace. In September 2018, 24-year-old Dutch inventor Boyan Slat launched an ambitious operation to use a giant boom and the ocean's natural currents to clean up the Pacific's giant island of plastic waste, known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Two months later, a crack in the system forced the prototype back to port, but the team was still able to collect terabytes of data and over two tonnes of ocean plastic waste. They report they'll soon be ready to relaunch. But what can we do with all the waste plastic we collect? In the UK, one inventor has found a clever way to plug potholes with a new road material made in part from waste plastic. And in the Philippines, a 15-year-old schoolboy undertook to tackle the country's plastic bag problem with a biodegradable variety made from coconuts. With clever ideas like these, we may just be able to stem the plastic tide. <laughs>